So while the last 18 months have been challenging for all of us, it has been a promising year for our industries with significant growth in Alberta and new opportunities emerging in provinces as diverse as Saskatchewan, Quebec, and Nova Scotia. Nonetheless, we are only scratching the surface of what is possible. We know that we can, and we must, do much more to ensure that Canada's future electricity system is decarbonized, affordable, and reliable. That's why today, Canria is releasing a new document presenting our vision of the role our technology should play going forward and what needs to happen to make that possible. C'est pourquoi Canria publie aujourd'hui un nouveau document qui présente notre vision du rôle que nos technologies devraient jouer à l'avenir et de ce qu'il faut faire pour que cela soit possible. Please welcome Robert Hornung, Canria's president. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Michelle, and good morning, everyone. Bonjour, merci de votre participation à l'événement Transition Electric Canada et au lancement exclusif de la vision 2050 de l'Association canadienne de l'énergie renouvelable. Thank you for being here this morning for the opening plenary session of Electricity Transformation Canada. Today, I'm proud that the Canadian Renewable Energy Association is launching Powering Canada's Journey to Net Zero. Canria's 2050 vision. Why 2050? Because that's the date by which Canada is committed to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions to respond to the biggest threat facing humanity today, climate change. Now meeting this target represents a significant challenge. While Canada has succeeded in stabilizing its emissions over the last 15 years, it has not succeeded in reducing them. The needle has barely budged from 739 megatons in 2005 to 730 in 2019. Now we all know that wind energy, solar energy, and energy storage must play a critical role in any successful journey to Canada's net zero targets. But what does that mean? What are the implications? What must change to make it possible? Are our industries up to the challenge? These are the questions that we answer in Canria's 2050 vision. It presents a vision of the future in which wind, solar, and energy storage are empowered to play the role that Canada needs them to play in order to successfully complete our net zero journey. Canria's 2050 vision is an urgent call to action for Canada's electricity sector decision makers to dramatically accelerate the deployment of wind energy, solar energy, and energy storage in Canada. La vision 2050 de Canria est un appel urgent à l'action pour accélérer considérablement le déploiement de l'énergie éolienne, de l'énergie solaire et des technologies de stockage d'énergie au Canada. Now, study after study has confirmed that achieving net zero requires a rapid decarbonization of electricity production and a doubling of that production to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through the electrification of transportation, buildings, and industry. This is going to require significant investment. And wind and solar energy are the lowest cost sources of new decarbonized electricity today and will continue to be so through 2050. Energy storage is also going to play a critical role, allowing us to maximize our vast, untapped wind and solar energy resources in this country. Canria's 2050 vision presents an illustrative but realistic scenario informed by numerous studies that demonstrates the significant growth of wind and solar energy that's going to be required to power Canada's journey to net zero. In this scenario, wind and solar energy supply a full two-thirds of the new electricity that will be needed to double electricity production in Canada by 2050. This means that wind and solar will represent at least one-third of Canada's total electricity production at that time. This represents an almost tenfold expansion in wind and solar energy capacity over the next 29 years. The scale and speed of such a deployment is unprecedented. 
It would require the build out of 3,800 megawatts of wind energy and 1,600 megawatts of solar energy every year between now and 2050. That rate of build out is three times faster than the fastest rate over any five year period to date for Canada. It's nine times faster than the rate of build out over the last five years. Now, whether our illustrative scenario is a bit high or a bit low, or if the mix in wind and solar is a little bit different, the fundamental conclusion remains the same. We need a massive expansion in Canada's wind and solar energy capacity. We also need to get started immediately. Our industries are up for the challenge and ready to play a critical role, but it won't just happen on its own. Canria's 2050 vision outlines five key tasks for governments, utilities, system operators, and regulators to enable our industries to deliver the capacity that's required. La vision 2050 de Canria décrit cinq tâches clés pour les gouvernements, les services publics, les exploitants de réseaux et les organismes de réglementation afin de permettre à nos industries d'offrir la capacité requise. These five key tasks. One, decarbonize the electricity system by 2035 through a clean electricity standard and full application of carbon pricing in the electricity sector. Two, modernize electricity markets and regulatory structures to enable new disruptive technologies like energy storage and distributed energy resources to provide services that support grid stability and security. Three, enable more opportunities for procurement of decarbonized electricity, including customer-driven procurement. Four, prioritize the efficient use of existing transmission infrastructure and pursue regional approaches to electricity grid infrastructure and operations. And five, implement comprehensive strategies to support and enable the increased use of decarbonized electricity to electrify transportation, buildings, and industry, and to produce green hydrogen for uses where electrification is more challenging. This is critical because our industries need increased clarity on the future demand for electricity to enable and justify the investments that are going to be required to build out this massive new capacity. To flesh out these five key tasks, Canria's 2050 vision identifies 15 specific measures that need urgent action. And I encourage everyone to visit our website at renewablesassociation.ca to explore the details of Canada's to-do list. Pour tous les détails sur notre liste de 15 mesures immédiates pour le Canada, je vous encourage à visiter le site web associationrenouvelable.ca. As we build this new capacity, our industries need to deliver on their responsibilities as well. We need to ensure community support and customer satisfaction. We need to contribute to sustainability and environmental protection. And we need to create economic advantages for Canadians, including Indigenous communities. On the economic front, our illustrative scenario would produce $8 billion in investment and 28,000 direct and indirect person years of employment annually for the next 30 years across Canada. Collaboration is also going to be key. Canria believes that wind, solar, and energy storage are going to be at the heart of Canada's future electricity system. But we also know that many other technologies are going to have an important role to play. Cost is going to be a key consideration in determining what other forms of generation will be built. And when we look at cost, it must include consideration of generation costs, life cycle costs, and the potential costs and benefits such technologies bring to the electricity system. We are eager to realize the efficiencies and synergies of working together with our allies and contemporaries. Canria is committed to working with all stakeholders in a constructive and positive way in pursuit of net zero solutions that ensure that Canada's future electricity system is decarbonized and expanded, but while prioritizing reliability and affordability. We need to act now, and we need to act together. Now, a diverse group of organizations has contributed statements to Canria's 2050 vision, 
signaling their support for the accelerated deployment of wind, solar, and energy storage as a key element on Canada's journey to net zero. These include Bell, the Canada Green Building Council, Clean Energy Canada, Electric Mobility Canada, Indigenous Clean Energy, Marsh, the National Bank of Canada, the Pembina Institute, Quest Canada, and Swiss Re. And we know that many other organizations recognize the important role our technologies must play to make net zero a reality. The science of climate change is pretty clear at this point. And I know we all are thinking about people in BC today and what they're going through. Canada faces a daunting challenge. But it's a challenge that we can meet but it requires us to take actions like those outlined on the urgent to-do list that I presented today. We are beginning a transformative journey to achieve an ambitious goal, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Failure to act on this challenge right now will present our children and grandchildren with much bigger challenges to address in the future. Canada's counting on us, counting on us to innovate in an environmentally responsible way that benefits Canadian communities and the Canadian economy, to capitalize on the synergies between our powerful technologies and to accelerate their deployment, and to deliver practical, achievable, affordable, and reliable real-world solutions to the crisis of climate change. That's what Canria's 2050 vision is all about. Canria's 320 plus members are Canada's leaders in the field of wind, solar, and energy storage. And I am absolutely certain that we are up to the challenge. Thank you very much, merci. Before going any further, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank a number of Canria member companies who are providing financial support for the wider dissemination of our 2050 vision. They are Blue Earth Renewables, Bullfrog Power, EDF Renewables, NG North America, Greengate Power Corporation, Kruger Energy, Northland Power, Pattern Energy, Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy, and Suncor. Their support is very much appreciated. And it's now my pleasure to move to the next part of our program, and call back to the stage Michelle Chislett, our Canria board chair, and the panelists who will now discuss and respond to Canria's 2050 vision. Et maintenant, il me fait plaisir de passer à la prochaine partie de notre programme aujourd'hui. Je tiens à remercier nos invités qui discuteront de la pertinence de la vision de Canria pour le groupe d'intérêt et pour le Canada dans son ensemble. Michelle and the panel, please come up. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, here I've got some panelists for our open opening plenary uh, to discuss the vision that Robert just presented to all of us. So uh, to my left, uh, far left here, this is Isabel Turcat from Pembina, welcome. Thanks. And next to her is uh, Tonya Leach from Quest Canada. Uh, then we've got Patrick Taylor from Microsoft, welcome. Uh, Brendan Kost Kostigen from National Bank and Dan Balaban from Greengate, welcome everybody. So to kick things off, I think I'll send the first question over to you, Isabel. Um, so the, the vision that Robert just spoke about calls for a dramatic acceleration in the deployment of wind, solar, and storage. And why is it important from your perspective, or your organization's perspective, that we achieve that? Yeah, thanks for the question, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad and humbled to be sharing the stage with you guys today and to be with all of you. Um, Kenria's vision is important because Canadians are already feeling the impacts of climate change. Um, of course, we're feeling them in uneven and unequal ways. Uh, in BC, the impacts are measured in lives lost. And so, uh, Ed was saying in jest earlier that we have 28 years until 2050, and of course, we know that that's not how we're approaching the challenge, and I really welcome Robert's urgent call to action because that's what we need to avoid worst impacts of climate change moving forward. 
And there's wide agreement that decarbonizing the power sector is the linchpin of any reasonable, rational strategy to tackle climate change. It is so for three reasons. Power is still a big chunk of emissions in many of our provinces. The second reason is that power is one of the sectors for which the pathway to net zero is most achievable. We know how to get there. We can do it with given technology that exists and emerging technologies. The third reason, of course, is that it offers massive opportunities to decarbonize other sectors through direct and indirect electrification with green hydrogen. Um, so those are the opportunities that we really need to seize. Uh, and unfortunately, Canada is a little bit behind in terms of deploying solar uh, and, and, uh, and wind. We are fourth among the G20 countries. So we have our work cut out. The other reason why Kenrio's vision is important is because beyond transforming the energy sector to deliver one that is non-emitting, it can transform the sector to deliver new benefits for Canadians, including better health outcomes, more affordable, reliable energy, jobs, especially important where we, we will be losing jobs in certain sectors as we transition to net zero. Uh, it offers new local opportunities for communities along with the benefits for these communities. And so that is really more than just the mutually beneficial approach of tackling climate change with a focus on other sustainable development goals. It's the promise of the transition to, to net zero if we get it right. So with that said, I'm eager to hear from my other panelists on this. Yeah, um, I guess Patrick, um, being at Microsoft, would love to hear your perspective on this question. Yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, I think for Microsoft, it closely aligns with our own corporate goals for being 100% renewable power for all of our data centers globally by 2025. And also, we've recently announced in July of this year that we're moving towards 100% carbon-free in all hours for all data centers globally by 2030. And so it's an ambitious target that we feel sort of aligns care closely with what um, our ambitions are. And I think it's, you know, a good time for us as we come out of COVID to really sort of reinvigorate the discussion around clean energy, zero carbon energy, and get people's attention in a more collaborative and coordinated manner to sort of solve those issues. So, you know, from our perspective, it closely aligns. Great. Okay, I think I'll move to the next, uh, the next question here. Um, so, I think what became uh, obvious as I read through the vision and listened to Robert this morning is we're obviously not on track. I mean, in Canada, I think we have a lot to be proud of as, as to where we've gotten to today. Um, but uh, the pace that we've seen, we're, we're just not, uh, we have to take it up to another level. So what needs to happen, in your opinion, to increase this urgency with which the issue needs to be addressed? So I'll pass it over to you, Brendan. Yeah, sure. I think. Um one of the ways we can accelerate this, uh, I, I would look at the, the storage part of that story um, and, and really try to get that right while those other technologies are obviously you know, hugely important and, and will be part of all of this. I think storage has the ability to support wind and solar, but that plus really catalyze, I think, um, further uh, you know, significant deployment in those technologies. And I think you know, I think the, the, the two ways that, well, a, a few ways that we should really be focusing is um, one, uh, ensuring that there's really uh, supportive market constructs uh, around solar. You're seeing a little bit of this, um, you know, obviously with the recent draft RFP that Ontario released and, and, and in a few other jurisdictions. So uh, lots more to do, but you're seeing really promising signs where people can have a lot of visibility around where to participate and how to participate. The other thing I think is hugely important is ensuring that we are attracting really efficient capital to storage and the, you know, including, you know, things like project finance, which wind and solar have obviously really benefited from. And I think in order to do that, we need more very clear revenue structures, contractual frameworks, offtake that, you know, will really, really, um, bring to the table a lot of those different capital sources. I think we'll see a lot of torque in storage deployment once those are, are done. But again, it's all, all part of the same picture with storage supporting wind and solar. Gotcha. Great, anyone else? Tanya? Yeah, I'll just jump in on that. Um, 
so agree with everything that, that was just said, uh, but I'm going to bring a bit of a different uh, perspective to this. The, your question was about increasing the urgency. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we can do is actually align and leverage those that are experiencing climate change impacts firsthand, who know and have embraced this urgency. And that's municipalities. Uh, case in point, it, we didn't need BC to be an example for us today, but unfortunately it is. Um, so far, we've been stuck in our old way of doing things, uh, which is a top-down energy planning approach. But our net zero future is going to be built from the bottom up. It's going to be solved with place-based solutions that address the needs of our communities and help to build the economies of our communities and strengthen them over time. Municipalities have purview of 60% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions and 50% of energy use. Um, and they also have the mandate uh, to, um, sorry, the mandate for community development itself. Municipalities have an important role to play in the implementation of renewable energy through a couple of different mechanisms, either as project implementers through development or investment, or as facilitators of projects through regulatory support and capacity building. Municipalities need your solutions. They need them for the economic benefits, they need them for the emission reductions, um, and they need them for better social well-being within our communities across Canada. So looking to our communities, um, aligning with them, and leveraging the urgency that they already know exists is our pathway forward to increased renewable energy deployment across Canada. Great, I think I'll turn it over to you a bit. I think you talk a lot about municipalities and communities. I think Dan Greengate spent a lot of time in communities. We'd love to get your two cents about that. Yeah, uh, you know, definitely communities have, uh, have an important role, but maybe a different, different tact on this. I think government policy, mm. clear government policy, consistent government policy is really important. We've seen, um, you know, lots of fits and spurts of um, development, you know, here in Ontario and Quebec. You know, right now, Alberta is the, um, you know, the um, renewable energy uh, darling of Canada, but it, but it shifts around and a lot of it has to do with inconsistent government policy. Uh, this federal government has said uh, a lot of the right things and I'm really hoping that in, um, you know, in this term with this new mandate, we start to see some action. This um, action, long-term consistent policy, I think is key to enable this long-term growth uh, that we're aspiring to. Agree, and I guess you know under the you know construct of government policy, I think some of the 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 things that come up there are reliability and cost questions. I think that's sort of the other side of that uh, of what's always trying to be balanced, right, Patrick? So, um, what do you think are some steps that need to be taken to address those two items of reliability and cost? Yeah, and I think I mean if I was to put the question differently, it would be you know how do we approach this from a thoughtful and considerate manner that doesn't burden ratepayers? and the system with unnecessary costs necessarily. And I mean, for, for, from our perspective, I think there's really sort of three things that come to mind. One that we've already talked about a fair bit is deployment of energy storage. I think, you know, as everybody knows, wind and solar are non-firm resources most of the time. And so storage can really help ensure that we're shifting some of that power when it's needed most. That's kind of an obvious comment. But I think, um, you know, be creative as you're putting those onto your projects. And, you know, certainly Microsoft is looking at a range of different projects in other markets that have energy storage as part of the product offering. Um, in California right now, actually, if you're, if you're doing a solar project in California, there are, as, as far as I'm aware, no projects in the queue that don't have solar plus storage in them. So it's a, mm -hmm. definitely a, a macro trend that we're seeing. And I think the other piece is, you know, when we, when we look at new projects, you know, certainly from our perspective, when we're screening through you know, RFPs, it's not just about price anymore, it's about value and the, yep. and the real carbon reductions that they bring. And so ensuring that, you know, if you take carbon as a, as a proxy for when there's reliability issues potentially on the system, um, because a peaking asset is potentially um, firming up, that's kind of an interesting place for us to have a discussion around how will this new project um, really have a maximum impact on the system and help bring down emission reductions, not just, you know, pay by weight in terms of volume of megawatt hours that you get uh, generated from the facility. So we're really trying to move, raise the bar and move beyond just volume and, and nameplate capacity. Yeah. And, and Dan, being on the other side, I guess, a buyer, seller, um, anything else to add to that? Uh, on, the, on the reliability. That's uh, right. How do you address uh, that in those? Yeah, Yeah. no, I think, um, I mean, the next generation of renewable energy projects are going to have to incorporate storage as, uh, as part, of, um, part of the solution. You know, we've seen, uh, you know, tremendous growth in, uh, 
you know, conventional renewables, if you can call that, right. which is, uh, you know, uh, produces into the grid when the wind blows or the sun shines. Um, but, um, you know, the next generation of renewables and, tr you know, uh, quite frankly, what's going to enable a whole scale transition to a net zero energy system is solving the, uh, the intermittency problem. And it seems to be uh, right on the verge of being solved with a whole variety of different storage technologies that are now becoming increasingly low cost and, uh, and commercial. Right. Just to, to build on that idea as well, um, so we've talked about some of the successes and how we can be proud, I think, as, as uh, Canadians as to where we are now. Um, but uh, what, what in that can we build upon to help implement the, the Canria vision as presented today? And so I think there's a lot of good there that we can build upon. And then I think you were started to touch on, Dan, some of the barriers that we have to overcome in order to, to reach the, the uh, you know, the ten, tenfold installation targets, right, that we're, that we're talking about. So any thoughts to that? Yeah, so, um, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, government policy and consistency of government policy is really important, but let's talk about what that means. Yeah. Um, you know, so what we're seeing, uh, you know, driving a lot of growth uh, in Alberta right now, and I think there's some lessons to be learned there, is uh, strong carbon pricing on the industrial sector, uh, which is creating uh, demand and value for the uh, environmental attributes uh, generated by renewables. But, you know, uh, Canada's, you know, uh, 10 provinces, uh, three territories, each with its own um, you know, um, unique uh, regulations. Um, so, you know, trying to find more consistency uh, across the board, I think, is really important. Uh, I think interties uh, across our country uh, are increasingly important. We have a bunch of different uh, markets that are essentially islands, but, uh, you know, connecting the great resources across our country and working together, I think, is going to get us there. Brendan, anything to add to that? Yeah, for sure. As far as successes, I mean, Look at Alberta and, and the bilateral agreements that are there, and, and corporate PPAs, and what you know Dan and, and, the, and the Greengate team are doing there. I mean, that's that's a great success. I think we can build on and try to introduce those structures across other provinces. But the the other thing I would say is, you know, as from a from a, a providing capital standpoint, I think you know we Canada has been very successful at developing. Uh, I, I would say a world class center of excellence here as far as, you know, it's not just the, the, the Canadian banks, you know, providing bank debt to projects. It's, it's, it's financial sponsors, it's strategic investors. Um, and, you know, if you look north and south of the border, you know, chances are on, on most deals, like you're going to see a Canadian party providing capital somewhere. So we've really, I think, developed uh, a world-class skill set here. Um, that I think we can continue to uh, you know, apply these really smart underwriting and investment criteria to new projects, new technologies, and just continue to you know, drive deployment that way. Yeah. So I think building on, you know, we heard about you know, different provinces are like islands. We've heard about sort of consistent government policy and whatnot. Um, and to build on another point that Robert mentioned this morning, you know, Given all that context, I think we're going to need massive amounts of collaboration and coordination to get us there. And where, in your view, is this most urgently needed? And I'll start with you, Tanya. Uh, yeah, so from my perspective, um, we see, I, I, so I absolutely agree with what, uh, what was said about the policy space. I'm going to layer onto that the planning space. Um, and what we're seeing is that municipalities and regions across the country and increasingly even down to the neighborhood, neighborhood level are developing community energy emissions plans. That's been going on for a number of years now. There's hundreds of them across Canada. Um, but then there's also energy planning that's happening uh, at kind of a tier above that, uh, you know, with the utilities themselves, whether they're LDCs or, or even into the, the gas um, systems as well. And each of them have their own uh, energy plans. Uh, and then we layer on top of that the provincial energy plans. And the problem with that, I mean, we need all of those layers, but those layers need to be integrated with each other and they need to be um, augmenting each other. And right now they're being developed mostly independently of each other. So we have um, this messy space where the planning doesn't align and therefore the policy can't align as well. So we've got to get the alignment at the planning level first that will allow us to have the policy align, which will actually kind of be that pressure relief valve, I think, that really does allow for the um, rapid deployment of renewable energy. 
Great. Thank you. Isabel, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, thank you. Um, it is great, Dan mentioned, that there are new policies being suggested to increase renewables on the grid at the federal level. Um, but provinces hold a lot of the power when it comes to the grid. And so with power must come uh, accountability. And with, in many provinces uh, across Canada, there's really a, a, a deficient policy architecture when it comes to really moving forward on decarbonizing every sector of the economy. Some provinces do not have a 2030 target. Many more do not have a 2050 target. And we need to get to a place where, of course, they have these targets so that there's an impetus to come to the industry and find and collaborate and work to put this, these solutions in place. So we do need these provinces to put in place these targets and renewable energy targets and net zero carb, uh, carbon grid targets um, so that then they come to the table and collaborate on maybe one aspect that where we need collaboration uh, most importantly is inner ties. Provinces need to come to see how there are mutually beneficial agreements that can be shaped. Um, and of course, the federal government has a role to play in there to make sure these, these agreements come to fruition. Maybe another point around the importance of collaboration um, is that climate action and actions to transform our energy sector also need to be pathways, uh, platforms uh, for reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so there are indigenous leaders across the country who are moving ahead with renewable energy projects. and. These projects are not moving fast enough, though. They're not multiplying fast enough, and they're not getting to the size of projects that we need to see. So we do need to see the alignment of policies at every level and certain changes in our colonial policies to allow for these projects to, to really uh, explode. Thank you for that. And you know, you mentioned the indigenous consultation piece, and I think what that brings up for me is, you know, the industry, right? Uh, we've talked a bit about what needs to happen in order, or you know, what uh, policy regulatory frameworks need to change and evolve in order to uh, instigate this kind of a deployment. But I think there's a responsibility on our industry, the wind, solar, storage industries, um, in order to ensure that this happens, but it also has the biggest greenhouse gas um, impact, right? So what, you know, the question really is, what do you think our industry needs to do in order to help enable it? What's incumbent upon us? And I'll, I'll turn to you, Patrick. Cool. Yeah, I mean, just to sort of build on the comments around policy, and I think there is definitely room to improve in Canada in terms of policy and framework. I mean, when I try to explain the Canadian electricity system to my colleagues who see, you know, different systems from around the globe, everybody goes like, woof, like, you're kidding, there's 10 different markets in, in Canada, there's only three, 30 million people there. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, discussion to be had. But I think, you know, to some extent, we have to start accepting sometimes that policy is what it is gonna be and we have to be creative around that. And, you know, certainly in some places like fully regulated markets in the US, you know, we found ways to collaborate with, you know, the incumbent um, vertically integrated uh, utilities that are there, the developers, and, and the Public Utilities Commission to come up with solutions that you know, achieve what's needed, which is the deployment of more renewables in a, in a reliable and cost-effective way. And so I think, just to bear that in mind, it's not always about trying to change the rules of the game to deploy more sometimes, because that day sometimes won't come. Yeah. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you know, the comments around you know, in, involving Indigenous partners and, and communities. Um, in the US, we've done a, a, a lot of focus on environmental justice and ensuring that um, you know, we are bringing in um, partners so that they can all enjoy in the, in, the, in the real benefits of these projects getting built and participate them in a long-term sustainable way. And I think that's just as important as the, as the overall pollution environmental benefits, the, some of the societal and, and community benefits that, uh, that can be shared, so. And I'd actually like to open this question up to the entire panel, I think, as our, as our last question. So, um, uh, Dan, maybe I'll turn it to you next. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot, of, uh, lot of different things that we can do, but I'll go back to what uh, a topic Tanya was talking about, communities and municipalities. You know, so if you look at the, you know, the history of uh, renewable energy development in this country, um, there's been times where um, it's, you know, the, uh, the growth has stirred up a lot of public opposition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we really have an opportunity here to um, reinvent the energies industry, energy industry's relationship with the communities in which with in which we operate. Um, you know, I think uh, renewables are really unique. They present 
uh, a rare alignment of uh, financial, environmental, and social positive impacts. And I think a real focus on that uh, to ensure that we have the license from, with, from the communities within which we operate uh, to, uh, you know, to meet our ambitious targets. Great. Isabel? Yeah, sure. H happy to, to add some elements of answer to, to that. Um, the, the climate crisis is often a communications crisis, a communications challenge. And so Canadians need to hear from the industry. And there are many misconceptions around, you know, what will be the cost of this? What will be the impact on, on my life? And they're hearing some narratives according to which there's going to be lots more negatives than positives. And so we need to meet them where they are, understand what their concerns are, and find the words that will really build more desire for a renewable grid because Canadians see the benefits. Um, so it's really a big call to a communication strategy uh, to talk to Canadians. Um, industry also needs to be heard by policymakers at all levels. Um, you know, I am reminded of my own experiences being at the consultation table for the output-based pricing system and uh, uh, being really outweighed by some folks who are a little bit pushing for the status quo. And whenever we have policy conversations moving forward in the next few months, the next few couple years, we need to hear industry loudly and proudly calling for those, those policies to be set at a level that's needed mm -hmm. to make sure that the regulatory environment delivers the right financial environment for these projects. Um, so it's, it's, the, it's a call to be heard by Canadians and policymakers at the federal and provincial level. Um, be, be loud. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Brendan, anything else to add? Yeah, I, I, um, I heard Dan mention, you know, changing communities' relationship to energy. And I, I completely agree with that. And I would, I would also add, like, we could change even households' relationship to energy. And seeing a, a lot of very promising trends in distributed energy resources. How do we operationalize that, um, for example, with, with uh, municipal utilities? Uh, how, do, how does the regulator start to uh, support that in terms of providing incentives for, for utilities to then uh, you know, be measured based on how households can have value from, from these resources? So I think those are, you know, as far as stakeholders you know, coming together and, and, and aligning on this particular element, I think, is, is hugely important. Great. And some closing thoughts, Tanya. I got the last word. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I really love what I'm hearing here. Um, I think that these, you know, a, a partnership, right? It's, it's, it's absolutely partnerships and partnerships in ways that you've never thought of partnerships in the past and being creative with those. Um, it's meeting communities where they're at. Everybody, uh, every community across Canada is in a different place. They have different needs. They need place-based solutions. Um, you have those solutions. So it's about bringing those to the table. Um, but doing that up front and working with them collectively on uh, both setting out their vision and achieving their vision. Um, so I, I would leave it with that. Um, I think partnerships are, are absolutely critical uh, in, our, in, our, in our low or no uh, mm -hmm. emission future. <laughs> Great. Well, I think uh, it truly is, to reiterate some of Robert's words, it truly is a transformative journey, right, towards a really ambitious target, um, but lots of good momentum to build on, and I think our industry is up for the challenge. So with that, thank you very much, each and every one of you. Uh, this concludes our, our, our opening plenary, and please join me in thanking our panelists today.